We're going to be in the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John this evening, and it's a blessing to be here. Appreciate Pastor Phil opening the, his pulpit. That, that takes some trust. That's a fine piece, though. And uh, very grateful for my dear brother Tom Price, dear friend for a very long time now. And I'm grateful for this family. It really is a family. And, you know, Tom's the guy that puts the photo album together for the family. It's kind of a, it's kind of a life magazine for our big family. And you get to look at it and, and see all these updates of, you know, brothers and, and, and sisters and, and the work, what's going on. And, you know, the magazine can only capture what's happening. It's difficult to capture all the behind the scenes, suffering and agonizing and all the internal, the internal things, all the, you know, the, you know, it was Lloyd, actually, who, who I believe on one occasion, we were talking about how pastors always say this, that this is a, it's a relay that we're involved in. And, you know, how every pastor ought to have a Timothy, you know, right? and you ought to have in your life, you need a Timothy that you're investing in, but you need a Paul that you're receiving from, right? I think it was Lloyd. I'm pretty sure it was Lloyd. It was a smart thought. It had to be Lloyd. And it was... Um, but every story needs also a Judas. Every story needs a San Ballad and Tobiah. You need enemies. You need difficult people. And all of that is all part of the recipe for what the Lord's doing in, in all of our lives. So in case we've not met before, um, I'm, so I'm the guy who, well, I'm, I'm the manhood rep for Calvary Chapel. At least, you know, every, all my pastor friends have me come and talk to their men. And so I've been, for the last 25 years, I have been to so many of, of your churches. I'm grateful for the invitation, for the brotherhood that we have. And I'm also grateful that you would trust me to talk to your men. And so that's what I've done and, and encouraged men to be men. That men ought to actually be men. And when God says, as he does... In Job chapter 38, when God says, like a man to Job, God says, stand up, gird up your loins like a man, and I'll ask the questions. When, and when God says, like a man, he means something. And among the things that God means, he means for a man to be brave, even when you're not, especially, especially when you're not. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's a refusal to obey it. And I think that as men, I think all of us men can testify that many times in our life, in order to do the actual manly thing, you've got to disobey your feelings, especially fear. You can't give in to that. And you can't let everybody know you're afraid either. You have to fake it. <laughs> and I sure have many times. I was absolutely faking it when the COVID tyranny all began. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to defy the government. I, by the way, um, my commendation to the brothers at Calvary Chapel Dayton who are joining us online for following a pastor like Pastor Gary who would take a stand, who would stand courageously. And again, it's not the absence of fear, just the refusal to give in to it. We obey something higher than our fickle feelings. About that, uh, men and women are different. I'm sure you're aware of that. <laughs> Very different. The madness of the days in which we live in can only be explained by the warning from God from Deuteronomy chapter 28. In Deuteronomy 28, God speaks to Moses, to the covenant people, and he gets really graphic in telling them how very cursed they will be they violate the covenant that they've entered into with him. He describes how blessed they'll be. But he goes on and on and on. Way longer section of Deuteronomy chapter 28 talks about just how very cursed they'll be. And in Deuteronomy 28, 28, God says to the covenant people through Moses, I will smite you with madness, blindness, an astonishment of heart. And ladies and gentlemen, there is no other explanation 
to the current climate of our American culture, then we have been struck absolutely mad. We have cast off everything that brought blessing. We've invited everything that brings with it the curse. We have even gone so far as if the, the murder of millions of babies in the abortion holocaust is not bad enough, not enough of an invitation to the judgment of God. Now, a second holocaust for the survivors of the abortion holocaust in our public education system where they are being thrown into, deliberately preyed upon and thrown into confusion with regard to even what are they? With regard to gender, are they men, are they women? The absolute madness that we are all of a sudden, it, it happened like a, you can only compare it to uh, Blitzkrieg, the Nazi, you know, lightning war, full throttle. And it's, it's broken out all over the nation. I want to talk to you tonight about what is, I guess if you want to give it a title, what is a woman? <laughs> and you're thinking that's going to, that's going to be weird coming from you, right? <laughs> you're thinking that, aren't you? I've encouraged men to be men. I allow that there are gentlemen. That I got this thing I've invented in my mind, at least, that it's the Mr. Scale. And, you know, uh, Mr. Rogers on one end and Mr. T on the other end. <laughs> and I know I need to update that. I haven't come up with any other Misters that fit that. But, you know, there, there's room on the Mr. Scale, right? For gentler men who, you know, I don't know, they design clothes or something. Or they. I don't know what they do, they play, but you know, they're, they're men, they're just like Mr. Rogers. He did puppet shows for kids. I, I remember a time in my young life where I thought Mr. Rogers was awesome, but I never wanted to be him. <laughs> ever, ever. Because <laughs> there's an other end of the scale, the spectrum. And that, that other end is the place that I always Felt more at home. And, and, and everybody wants to uh, uh, discourage that. They, they call it machismo. They, they criticize it as toxic. But I actually do believe that there is no such thing as toxic masculinity on men. It's toxic when it's on women. <laughs> toxic masculinity is what you see when a woman presumes that with a little testosterone and a thicker watch band, she could be part of my gender. That's toxic. That's to that is toxic to her. She fails to understand what I am. In the similar way, I will tell you that any man who thinks that all he needs is a change in fashion and a knife and some Estrogen, he could become you, my dear sisters. He has no idea what you are. He has no idea the depth of what you are. No idea. It is, it is so offensive. It's so insulting. And nobody's more insulted than, than God, the creator of this, this, this reality. Let me go to the text. <laughs> John chapter 8, verse 1. Now Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman, was taken in adultery in the very act. I personally am horrified that they would admit that. I really am. It's creepy. They, these 
are a bunch of creepy old religious men. They really are. You, you imagine, these are the guys who, who uh, live in their cap and gown. They wear their education. They wear their, their, their religious garb. Continues to sort of advertise the depth of their schooling, right? And when we really dig in to the vileness, the ugliness of this thing that they do here, it's a beautiful scene. It's a beautiful scene. It's, it is our Lord, the Good Shepherd, sitting, surrounded by the flock, the sheep, that he has welcomed in. It's, it, it's his father's house. That's the setting. His father's house, which, by the way, he cleansed with a whip. He drove out money changers and sacrifices. He drove out animals and men with a whip. He hurt their feelings. He stung them. But he did them no harm. He made a space where everybody could come in. They could sit and listen, and he taught. And that beautiful scene is interrupted by the ugliness of these religious men. Wolves, that's what they are, wolves. Wolves come into that beautiful scene, bearing in their jaws a victim they throw in front of the good shepherd. They go on to say in verse 5, Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? Hmm? <laughs> what sayest thou? John writes, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. The coolest thing about John in his gospel is that John was probably still in his teens, the youngest of the twelve. He writes as an old man, thinking back to all of those years, and you can still hear the wonder as the Spirit of God inspires his writing. You can still hear the wonder, the admiration that he has for his king. Because he, he describes this ugly scene. And he tells us what they were up to. They said this, tempting him, they might have something to accuse him. And he goes, but Jesus stooped down with his finger, wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Our Lord didn't break into a tremble, beating sweat for this terrible dilemma. This was nothing for him. They came in there with their victim that they intended only as bait for a trap. And the Lord doesn't start stroking his beard troubled. He ignores them and stoops and writes. Ignoring them, he, he, he writes as if he didn't hear them. As if he hasn't already come down far enough. The, the, the wonder of the incarnation, that he would become a man, that he would come all the way. And that is the preposition that he used in John chapter 6. The real bread of life is he who comes down to give life to the world. Way, 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 way down. For him to become a man, for him to join us, to add humanity to his divinity was something greater than anybody could ever illustrate. It's not geographic distance. It's something incomprehensible. It's the, it's the infinite distance that would be represented with words like, uh, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways. An infinite distance that he was willing to cross to, be, to become one of us to live among us. I make much of the incarnation. I have often said, and perhaps you've heard me say this before, it would be every bit as extreme, it's even more extreme, than if you, on your, uh, I don't know, you guys take walks out here in this desert? <laughs> on your walk? 
Do you step out from the air conditioning and go take a walk? Imagine one of those really, really Hades-like days, but it's a dry heat, and <laughs> you are out on your walk in some back road, and you're confronted by a waft of stench that can only belong to something dead. You walk a little further, and you discover the source is laying there on the side of the road, swelling in the Nevada sun, just filling with the gases of decomposition. It's roadkill, and it's not playing. It's a possum. It ain't playing. It is so dead. You with me here? And as you approach it further, if you happen to be a man, you kick it. And you don't know why. You don't have a philosophical crisis. You just kick that thing. It deflates a little bit, flips over. And you discover after that kick that though that thing is very, very dead, it is teeming with living things. You with me, girls? Can you imagine having any interest, any compassion for that nasty low form of life that lives in that? Maggots, ladies. Fly larva. Like when your husband missed trash day. And you go out after two weeks of buildup and you're dragging the can to the curb and you find yourself asking, when did we get takeout rice? Oh. It's not rice. You're with me here. Now, this is the lowest form of life that I can come up with outside of Congress. So I have to try to use this. Lowest form of life I can come up with outside of government. How about that? Would you enter their world? Would you become one of them? Would you then live in their world of rot and death that they don't think is that bad? Because they're maggots. Their standards are low. They've not known anything better. You have. Would you enter that world of death and decay that they call home? Would you identify yourself as son of maggots? Let the maggots spike you to a tree. It's all absurd, isn't it? Now, I realize that illustration has its problems, but one of its biggest problems is it's not extreme enough. The distance between you as a human being created in the image of God, though the image of God is marred, you are still so much higher, higher than the maggot, higher than all the sparrows. You're worth more to God than all the rest of creation. And yet, the distance between you and the maggot, though great, fails because the distance between God and man is that, that great. And that distance, the Son of God, second person of the Trinity, crossed that distance to become one of us. And then he stoops as if he hasn't gone low enough. He stoops. He stoops to a lower place than the wolves who come with their trap. He stoops to a lower place than even perhaps the accused woman. Takes a lower place than where she's been stood. Now let's, let's, let's visit her for just a moment, can we? The ugliness of the words. This, this woman, how do they say it? I believe in the way that they said it, you could hear the contempt that they have. The lack of deep appreciation for what a woman is. The very creation of God. The very pinnacle, the, like the grand finale of a progressive creation that's recorded for us in Genesis 1 and 2. I don't think that the creation of man on the sixth day was God's grand finale. But the division of that man 
into two very different, slightly similar, but profoundly different people. Yes, I do make much of what God did not do, Genesis 2 tells us in verse 7. When it came to making Adam, it is written, And the Lord God formed the man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. He formed man. Complex combination of the matter and spirit, the very dust of the earth and the breath of God. God says, Genesis 2.18, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. What God does not do, God does not form her from the dust of the ground and breathe into her nostrils the breath of life and she become a living soul. God does not repeat Genesis 2.7 to make Eve. Why? Because she was already there. She was already present, but where? Where was she? She was half of who Adam was. I want you to follow me on this thought. I don't have very deep thoughts, but I have this one. <laughs> that when God created Adam, as it is written, he made him in his own image. He made Adam in his own image. What did God divide but his own image, his own likeness? I submit to you that God, in a very real sense, is, um, is everything, everything that you and I understand as male and female, everything that you and I understand as man and woman, all of it has its source in the image of of our Father in heaven. And I'll further add, he is best represented by his Son, who's not made in the image of God. Colossians 1.15 says he is the image of the invisible God. I guess what I'm trying to point out to you, especially for you ladies, is that God put that man into a deep sleep and extracted from him. I know what our English Bibles read. The Lord God took a rib. The same word that we translate rib in Hebrew can be translated side. I maintain that God took one whole side. This has been my thesis for the last 25 or 30 years to all the churches. God took one whole side of the image imparted to Adam. I'm telling you that when the man woke up, he was altered and he knew it. He was like, ah, ah, what'd you do to me? I believe when he came up out of that deep sleep, he went into that sleep a far more balanced representative of the God who created him. Pastor Chuck said it this way. Pastor Chuck would say, man is not all there. Man ain't all there. <laughs> You're looking at any man you need to know, he just ain't all there. There's a lot that was taken. And it's a reality. I believe he woke up and went, Ugh, I want to build stuff. <laughs> I want to conquer. And I, I, uh, I feel, what is it? Nothing. I don't have hardly any feelings. <laughs> I, I had big feelings when I went to sleep. And I wake up and they're gone. In case nobody's informed you, dear ladies, <laughs> men are different from you. <laughs> they have feelings, but they're really small. They're really not worth talking about. <laughs> and you're trying to extract from them something that isn't there, I'm telling you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> what I'm saying to you is, Leave that man alone. <laughs> oh, think about all these foolish statements. The years of telling men, you got to get in touch with your feminine side. You don't have a feminine side. It was surgically removed by God in Genesis chapter 2. 
You, you get a feminine side when you get a wife. Mm. Surgically removed. And oh, what a wonderful thing it was that God did. What a beautiful thing. Adam's like, where, 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 where's my, where'd my feelings go? God made a presentation to him. God brought her to the man. And he has the deepest of understanding. She was taken out of man. He's not just talking about flesh and bone. He knows she is his flesh and bone. But that statement, she was taken out of man. We could talk all night about the differences between men and women that are obvious, that are observable, that every Walmart shopper used to know. <laughs> we could, but we don't have time. Let me just point out to you this much. The average man's body is about 40% muscle mass. The average man's body is about 40% muscle mass. We're made different physically. You know that, right? The average woman, the average woman's body is about 20 to 25% muscle mass. You know that, right? You already know that. That's why men and women don't compete in the same sport. All right? It doesn't, I don't have to ramble on about that rant. I don't have to rant. I've said enough on that, right? In the same way, men have their big muscles, women have their little muscles. You can take that exact, I'm, I'm speaking to you right now, right now as a pastor of more than four decades and a human of six decades. <laughs> and, and, and as a man who grew up in a house filled with females. I have only a whole batch of sisters and my mom. And my observation, what I say to you now, I say from a lifetime of observation, you can take that differential, 40% muscle mass versus 20% muscle mass, and reverse it when it comes to depth of emotion. In case you don't know it, women have huge feelings. Enormous, frightening, powerful, <laughs> incomprehensible <laughs> feelings. Men have little feelings. The only big one we have is anger. Because we have to fight wars and stuff. I believe this is borne out in the scripture. I consider the things that are written both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. I would just also point out to you, if I may, God brought the two, the two of them together. God took one man, tore him in two, in such a way that those two can become one. And in that oneness, in their unity, in the covenant, there is a sense in which you have a better representation of God the Father with the two of them completing each other, making up for what the other lacks, complementing one another. That's the plan of God. We offer something not only to our children, but to the whole world. You see, I, I would make the point to you that our king, our hero, he is all of that all by himself. That he is the image of the invisible God. Never altered as Adam was, not divided into two. That he is both Lamb of God and Lion of Judah in one glorious person. I mean, he's, he is soft as silk and Heart is a diamond, silk and steel. He, he is everything from the Mr. Rogers end to the Mr. T end, depending on what the situation demands. Fierce, the lion, who weeps with the heart of a mother over Jerusalem. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God created man in his image, 
divided man into two genders, two sexes. The attack on manhood has been underway for a long time. Now, sisters, womanhood is now under attack like you could never have imagined in your entire life. The offensiveness, oh, the, the wickedness of any man strutting around in your clothes, thinking he, he could just be you with, with an act of the will. No idea the depth of what God made you. And he wired you different than a man. You could also title this, um, if you want to, you could just title it, Why Women Suffer More Than Men. Why women hurt more than men. Do you want to know why they hurt more than men? Well, I think there's three reasons given to us in a careful study of Genesis 3.16. I wish I could preach just tonight on Genesis 3.15, the very first promise of a Savior, the promise of, a, of a, a conqueror who will suffer to conquer. But it's the 16th verse that for the sake of this story, I, br I would draw your attention to. For it was God called, God invited confession from our first parents, Adam and Eve. Our mother, Eve, and our father, Adam. They come out, God draws confession out of them, God curses the serpent, pronounces that one day a man will crush his head. He'll bruise that man's heel. But then God turns to our mother Eve, and he said, I will greatly multiply your pain. I will greatly multiply your sorrow. King James Version. If you were to go with the newer translations, they'll use the word pain. I will multiply your sorrow and your conception. Look at what God says. Under the woman he said, I will greatly, greatly, do you see those words? I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. He used the word sorrow twice. I don't think it's accidental. He used the word sorrow or pain twice. God will use the same word in, in verse 17 to Adam once. Now does that mean God is going Oh, you've been bad, girl, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna do to you. This is not what's happening. This is not God punishing. This is God, the Creator, no doubt with a cry in His voice, explaining to her the consequences of what has happened. That in this new arrangement, where sin has entered and death by sin, everybody suffers but she'll suffer worse. Yeah, I believe that God actually uses the word sorrow twice on purpose. And he said, your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. It was always God's intention that Adam would be the head of his family. God wired the man to be the head of the house. God wired every woman to be the heart of the home. The head and the heart were to work together. They were to complete each other. That's not what God is talking about when he says, your desire shall be to your husband, he shall rule over you. There is a tyranny that will be the result of the introduction of sin that women suffer under. There's a tyranny because she's wired with a need. Please hear me. She is wired with a need so very different from any man. I, I, oh, I wish I had time. Um, I, I have said for years, <laughs> men and women are different. Little boys are made for war. They're born into this world knowing as soon as they get here, the universe is at war. It's good versus evil, and they want to be in it. Little girls are made for love. 
girls come into this world for relationship. They learn speech. You know that if, you, if you've reproduced little humans. If you've had a boy and a girl, little girls figure out how to talk fast because it's important to them because words allow you to connect with another soul. They're made for relationships. Give that little boy a stick and say, go play with that stick. What's he going to do with it? Or he'll put it on his shoulder. It's a rocket launcher. Give a little girl a stick and she'll go, hello, what's your name? And find another stick that they can interact with. And you'll have Mr. and Mrs. Stick. And because that's how God made you can argue with me if you want, but you'll be wrong. Um, my very observant teenage son, Ben, made a statement about a year ago to me. It was profound. He goes, Dad, I figured something out. I said, what is it, Ben? Ben goes, girls talk in cursive. And uh, boys talk in print. That was deep. And profoundly true, as he went on to sort of describe a little tale at the end of each letter. <laughs> it's like you can hear it. Very insightful. Say, so I actually believe that every little boy's got an even God addresses it in the New Testament. The New Testament addresses in, within marriage. What is that one need that a wife has the chance to affect in the heart of a man? He has a desire, a need put there by God to know that he is believed in, that he's respected. A much deeper need has been wired by the Creator and every single woman, and that is to know that you're loved. And he addresses it. He addresses it in the New Testament commands. That a husband should love his wife even as Christ has loved the church and gave himself that he might present her to himself. Oh, to know, to know that you're loved. I, I submit to you that the only explanation for the mystery in Genesis chapter 3, when sin comes into the picture, and Adam says to God, the woman you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And God turns his attention to the woman, and the woman says, God says to her, what is this that thou hast done? And she said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. She admits to having been lied to, that she believed some lies. She believed a lie called evolution, Lucifer's invention, that one could ascend, that God was trying to keep you down, trying to prevent your ascension. She believed, therefore, that God was not good. She acted on that. I point out to you that Adam did not say, I was deceived, nor could he. If he's not deceived, why did he eat that fruit? God said in Genesis 3, 17 unto Adam, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. He wasn't deceived. But he was affected by what she said. What did she say? I'll tell you what she said. I'll tell you. Our mother Eve became the mother of all insecurity. There's no doubt in my mind that she pleaded with him. She ate what was forbidden. She was instantly altered. And now she sees Adam looking at her, going, why are you looking? And she's like, why are you looking at me like, don't look at me like that. I'm still the same. Adam, don't leave me. She pleaded. I'm telling you, she pleaded. Because Adam's admission is not the cute little blame shifting that most preachers think it is. No, it's worse. Adam had to say to God, I was in this situation. I had to choose. It seemed like I had to choose between him, her and, and you, and I chose her. I chose the gift over the giver. I chose the created over the creator. Sorry. The shame of Adam's sin is the idolatry that she had become a goddess to him. Three reasons why women hurt more than men. And I maintain they hurt twice as much as men. Number one, 
Ladies, you are emotionally deeper in ways that I don't pretend to fully comprehend. But I'm able to observe. You have a greater depth of emotion than any man. And I know there are these pathetic little boys that th there are boys with beards that will just go on and on about what they feel. Can't even start a sentence without. I feel like, um, I feel like that's true. I feel like that's so true. I feel like, I feel like, I, I feel like we should be careful. I feel like, I feel like you're mocking me right now. No, I am mocking you. It's not a feeling, it's a reality. You're actually being mocked. Listen to this one, all you men, at whatever age, we must encourage all men to leave boyhood behind. Boys go on and on about what they feel, because that's all they know. They're little babies and they just go wah, and they learn words and keep doing wah. Just announcing what they feel. Men stop announcing what they feel and ask what has to be done. We don't walk around all day going on and on about what we feel. It's, it's secondary. I'll put it that way. It's a boy who pretends he's got big giant feelings, but they're not big giant. I, listen, what I'm saying to you is it's just as appalling as any man wearing a dress with his hairy chest hanging out. <laughs> that a guy walks around going, I have deep feelings. Oh, shut up. You don't either. You have no idea what deep, deep emotions God put in a woman. Now, I haven't even gotten to the text. That was all preface. It's, um, what time is this supposed to end? <laughs> don't encourage that. No, don't. <clears throat> that can actually happen. Let me, let me try to wrap this up. All right. He said, listen, ladies, you are emotionally deeper, so much deeper. At the same time, I'm sure you know this, you are physically weaker. And thirdly, you are wired with a need different than any man, and it always puts you at a disadvantage. You've been at a disadvantage your whole long life, and you always will be, because you feel much more deeply. You're wired with a need to know that you're loved. And it, under the curse, becomes it both the, it's like the very core of all your hopes and dreams and all your worst fears. The fear of the loss of love, the fear of the loss of the loved one, the fear that you'll not be loved, the fear that love will be withdrawn, or the fear that it will happen again. Now, let's go to the story. Knowing that women are emotionally deeper, physically weaker, wired with the need to know they're loved. Consider this poor woman. The religious, they go, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So the question is, why is she alone? If she was taken in, in adultery, in the very act, where is the man? The absence of the man that she was committing adultery with is what I will base everything that I'm about to say about this whole story. The very fact that he's not there tells you it was a setup. Tells you this woman was manipulated it, it screams of other details that I believe are all here in the story. She was somewhere, this poor woman was somewhere out of the sight of witnesses. No one had ever been executed for the capital crime of adultery. Because the same law that makes it a capital crime requires eyewitnesses. 
people don't commit adultery in front of eyewitnesses. The law was very specific too, by the way. You were not, you were not able to accuse somebody because you saw them coming out of the same chamber or you saw them getting dressed. Eyewitnesses, this is the, the graphic part of this, eyewitnesses that the law requires to execute somebody for this capital crime would have to actually see the God-created connection that was not supposed to be made between two people who are not in covenant. Do you understand? They're coming there, accusing her. That means they've seen this. And if they're close enough to see there, then where is he? You know what that tells me? He was one of them. He was in on it. I want to paint a picture for you. At some point, as these self-deceived stewards of Israel's spiritual state, they confer together in their council. They, they stroke their gray beards. And they conspire. They need to drive a wedge between him and Moses. They've attempted it before. They consider themselves real champion strategists. They're real chess players. <clears throat> and they believe <clears throat> that they know enough about him to know that he is not going to want any woman executed. His enemies know enough about him to know he's not going to want a woman executed. But what do they need for this trap? They need a woman. And I submit to you that in their secret chambers, they invented the setup. And someone in that meeting said, we need a woman. Does anybody know the kind? We in modern culture, and I suppose for a very long time, we talk about those women. We call them things. We, we call them trams. Ladies call them hussies. That hussy. <laughs> Men, boys, even in your high school, speak of the girl that is easy. I submit to you that those are people People that Christ died for, people whose dad did not do their job, people who were unloved, even abandoned and abused. And they, they, they advertise their need. I know about this. My mother was that girl. It maybe sound like an awful thing to say about your mother. My mother, I loved my mother. Two years ago, she went to be with the Lord. She was a woman beaten, she was a girl, beaten, beaten severely by her father. She fled that as a teen, ended up with my father, who picked up where her father left off, beat her bloody, beat her, broke her heart, and then threw her and her kids away. I saw my mother suffering, I'm an eyewitness to both her blood and her tears, her brokenness. Then the years that followed, where she, she dressed in a way that would absolutely humiliate me if she came to the school. She came to believe that all she had to offer that was of any value was just what could get the attention of men. Her heart was crying out, somebody just love her. And I was so sad. The poverty and the danger of, the danger of that childhood, the, the misery of it. You know, the Lord used it in my life, he really did. But as, as great as my suffering was, man, my sisters and my mother, I'm an eyewitness to how they suffered through life. A broken heart. My, my mother, she wore really short skirts and really high heels, and high boots, and she strutted around town. It got her all the wrong kind of attention from all the wrong kind of men. And at the worst of it, at the peak of it, in a little main town, my mother was gang raped by the citizens some of the men of that town. My mother suffered much. There was nobody that came to her rescue, and, and the men who did it knew they wouldn't. They, they knew there was no one that would come to her rescue, and her boy was too little. 
And I learned of this, and I learned it from her. I just wanted to grow. I wanted to grow. I wanted to get big enough to avenge my mother. I wanted to avenge my family. I wanted to kill them all. And it became, really was, like a worm in my brain that was going to make me crazy. I was on a trajectory to a, a life of violence that would probably end early. The grace of God interrupted all that. I'm so very grateful for that, that grace. I know about the kind of woman they were talking about. <clears throat> I heard people in that little town talk about my mother like that. There was a girl that somebody told her she was beautiful. Some punk, some, some religious punk that was in this meeting said, I, I, know, I, know, I know a girl. I can get her there. But I, I've got to be exempted. And, and the legal mind, experts of the law, well, they were great at loopholes. The very fact that they brought the woman and not the couple tells you that there was a f horrible moment when in the privacy of that place, she's giving what she should never give. And all through the history of humanity since sin came into this picture. Women have been talked into giving sex with the hope that they're going to get love. And lying males promise love just to get sex. And it happened again. And suddenly the curtains were ripped open. And that private moment There's a very real sense in which this lady was gang raped by the leering eyewitnesses who had to actually see. Do you understand what I'm telling you? They had to actually say they saw and they could condemn her. Then she suddenly pieces together the man lied to her. He didn't love her. He was mocking her as he backed up and joined them. And they drag her out of that chamber through the holy city. How dressed? Up to the holy place to stand her in front of the holiest man that's ever been. Had she heard of him? Had she met him? Had she hoped to meet him? Not like that day. Not like that. All the way there, no doubt. All she can think of is, he lied. He lied. It was a lie. It was a lie. And now I'm going to die for what I fell for. She's thinking she's going to die for what she fell for. And at some point or another, I submit to you that motherly instincts that every, <clears throat> every lady has might have also kicked in and as she suddenly started piecing together there in the presence of our Lord, that she was not the ultimate target he was, and now she was being used. These men are using her to trap him, and her pity shifts from her to him. But I like to believe, knowing him like I think I do, that he looked at her. He wouldn't ignore her. But he looked at her eyes. I bet she saw in his eyes something very unexpected. The absence of disappointment, the absence of outrage. Rather, I, I, I suspect she saw a look that said, don't worry, girl, I got this. Wait a minute, don't worry about this. I got this. A look that gave her some kind of peace as he went to writing on the ground. John uses an interesting word. He wrote. John uses the word kadagraphene. Kadagraphene is different than graphene, the normal word for write. Kadagraphene is like when you're writing a record against somebody. Or when somebody in modern culture pulls out their phone and starts recording you. You know they're going to use that, right? When somebody whips out their phone, they are trying to get a record to use against you. That is kadagraphene in a written sense. 
And yes, I will credit David Guzik, who did my homework for me on that one. <laughs> he does all our homework. Cadagraphine. He wrote. What did he write? We don't know. He kept it between him and them. What a, what a merciful king. But what we do know is the reaction to what he wrote. Verse 7 says, when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. No disagreement with Moses, perfect agreement with Moses. In fact, let's just do actual Moses all the way. The eyewitnesses are to cast the first stone. And the eyewitnesses among you. Listen, this verse is often quoted as if we were supposed to never take a stand against any kind of lewdness or sin. A woman in your world needs to know the hero that we read about tonight. And he might come to her rescue. The one that came to your rescue. I said, all you men, I believe that the Lord has called us to represent him, to introduce them to him and let him be their hero. We don't need to be their heroes. But at the same time, brothers, I would tell you what the apostle Paul told young pastor Tim, 1 Timothy chapter 5. He said, Tim, hey, Tim, don't rebuke an older man harshly, but treat him like a father, and treat him, exhort him, encourage him like a father. And then he put the same verb to Tim and said, do the same, and treat all the older women as your mother. And treat all the younger women as your sister in absolute purity. I think there's a significant number of gray-headed men like me in the room. I think if Paul were to write to you and I, as he wrote to Timothy, he would add, treat all those young women as your daughter and your granddaughter in absolute purity. The world is broken. The world needs Christ. And the women are suffering. And womanhood itself is under attack. This is the time where we ought to proclaim biblical truth on these matters with more conviction than we ever have. We ought to open up Genesis and lay it out to the whole world. We ought to be equipping the church to know these things that are revealed in Scripture. Father, I pray in the name of our King, in the name of the one whose actions in the account that we have read here to, tonight solicit once again our admiration, our deepest admiration, our wonder. There's no one like him. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to represent such a king to a world as broken as the one that we live in. That you'd help us to contend for truth. That you'd help us to contend for men and women. Stand up. and Speak up. Reach out. Lord, please help us be, to be those people empowered by and led by the Holy Spirit, that we, like you, could come to the rescue of the victims that are all around us. They're in our churches. Father, I pray that you'd help us to live in an ever-growing and deepening understanding of what you made us when you made us men and when you made us women. And please, Lord, help us to act on that knowledge in a way that is useful, I pray it all in the name of Christ, our King. Amen.